Welcome to the Red Mill Museum Village, one of the most incredible places of history that you're going to find, not just in New Jersey, but in the whole country. Behind me, you see the most photographed building in New Jersey, one of the top in the country, and it's what started it all back in 1810. When we go through our tour, you're gonna to see how they started processing wool, then processed grist, all the way to talcum powder. Uh, there's so much involved. Our whole museum village, which is over 10 acres, houses a dozen buildings, including a schoolhouse, a tenant house, a quarry office. Uh, a, we also have a um, log cabin where they used to live, a schoolhouse. It's an amazing, amazing experience. You're going to see in our quarry how they processed the rock wall of limestone, turned it into fertilizer, turned it into dynamite, and also crushed it to start making all the roads in the town. Also the mortar that was used to build the town of Clinton. We house over 30,000 pieces of artifacts from the colonial era of the 1800s and even some before and up to show what life was like back then. It's an incredible experience. We are so lucky to have you here. Come join me. You're going to see things that you've never thought you'd see before. in the heart of the mill right by our water wheel without this none of this would be possible the power from the river turns the water wheel which converts it into our powertrain which turns all the pulleys and gears needed to operate all the machinery in the building this place changed so many times with the times to adapt to what was needed it started out as a wool factory back in the late 1700s where they made wool but once it was starting to get imported from Europe. That business failed. Then it turned into a grist mill because there were so many farms here that needed their crops converted. So they took corn, wheat from the fields, turned it into flour. After that, they also made talcum powder. We were one of the first accounts of Colgate to make talcum powder. Also made graphite for pencils, which was very much needed. Wasn't very popular in town because they made a lot of black dust that covered the town over. So, but it was very neat, much needed to process everything. And then later on, the same wheel generated electricity for the first time and powered the town of Clinton for four hours a day for a few pennies. So without this, none of it would be possible. You have a question? So when it floods, does the wheel go really fast? Mother Nature is really hard to control, but they did an amazing job at it. There's a series of valves put in throughout the whole mill that control the flow of the water, which would control the speed of the wheel. It was extremely important at that time so that if it did rain hard or there was a storm, the wheel wouldn't go too fast so it wouldn't burn any of the products they were making. What I'm leaning on now here is called the husk frame. The sole purpose of these amazing sets of wood was to hold the 2,000 pound granite grinding stone up on the next floor. All the gears that were needed to process that wheel and turn it were extremely heavy. So without these special beams put in and support, it would just fall right through the floor. Even though the majority of the mechanical equipment here was run from the powertrain, which was created by the water wheel, there were still other things that needed to be run without it. And there were so many different components. So a lot of times they incorporated a simple old fashioned treadmill, which they designed. And our little pal here, which is our mascot called Sparky, was one of the animals that they would use if they didn't have enough manpower. So inside dogs were very popular to put on here. And as they turned the treadmill, it would turn some more of the pulleys that were needed to power and move things from different floors. Outside they used bigger versions and they used horses outside. But it was very creative, and even for back at that time. Do you have a question? Why is all of it stone and then there's a little spot of brick? That's a great question. Over the course of the years, when the first floor of this building was made in the 1700s, all they had were old stones and mortar from the, that was made from the limestone. But as years progressed and they made something like bricks, 
they would use them because they lasted longer and they were more supportive. So when holes appeared, they would just use what was the best material available, which at that time were bricks. All right, as I showed you before about the power train, which was so important, there's one of the bottom trains of the pulleys. You'll see by the time we get to the fourth floor how massive these were and how much water power it took to make this turn all the way up to the fourth floor. And as we move up the mill to the second floor, you'll see the grindstones. And then when we get to the fourth floor, you're going to see the top half of that pulley. It's going to be pretty amazing. So here we are on the second floor where a majority of the work took place that involved grinding and processing the corn. And what I'm standing in front of now is the most important piece, the granite grindstone. This is the one I was talking about before. It weighs 2,000 pounds and was intricate in processing it so it could get to the next level. This wheel was very, very delicate, even though it weighed 2,000 pounds, it had to be hand carved and it had to be turned at right to precise speed so that the corn underneath it wouldn't burn. In fact, if it turned too fast, uh, they actually had somebody here whose their job was to lie down on the floor next to it to smell it. If they smelled a smell like burning toast, they would jump up, ring the bell and start to turn the wheels down to slow the wheel so the product wouldn't burn because that could cost them their job, it would cost product, nobody would be happy, and the most dangerous thing, it could cause a fire. There were actually six other mills on, on this river that all burned down because they weren't careful about fire hazard. Also, because of the fire hazards, they had to have buckets down. So if you notice through here, the buckets are all hanging from the ceiling with round bottoms. And that's because they didn't want them on the ground because there was so much activity and so many people walking around, it would have been very easy to trip and knock over a bucket of sand or water and it wouldn't be available when the fire happened. Again, there were three or four different machines that caused a process of, of utilizing the, the corn into different stages from the shucking machines being processed to the intermediate steps, which would bring it over to the grindstone, which would grind it into the finest material so it could be put in the elevators and sent up to the fourth floor to the bolt machine that we talked about. You have a question, sir? How did they get the grindstones up here? That's a really good question. That's also a very, very difficult job. Since they were so heavy, they needed numerous pulleys. They needed a lot of men, and they took it up in different stages through the trap doors. So they would wrap ropes around it and hoist it up very slowly. But it took probably about a dozen men to lift this and pull it up. So that was one of the nice pulley systems that were run also by the water. So it helped bring it up. So it was very, very hard. And they needed to replace them a few times a year because by grinding, the more grinding they did, the patterns wore out and they had to be replaced. As we've already seen, most of the jobs here were very difficult, very demanding, very dangerous. But there was still a workforce there that needed jobs. And also another need to make as much money as possible. So they came up with the idea of making baskets. Since there were so many farms here for peaches, apples, and other fruit, nothing to carry them in. So a period of time, people sat here and made baskets out of the wood that came available. This behind me is a fruit sorter which sorted out the different fruit, broke off the branches, and made it easier to put into the baskets. So that when farmers came and dropped off their corn and wheat to be processed, they also were able to buy baskets from us to take home to harvest their fruit. It was a great idea for the time. So now we're ready to go up to the fourth floor to check out where all the final processes happen. It's gonna be amazing. Can't wait to see it, let's go. All right, come on everybody, we made it to the fourth floor. That was a long way up, wasn't it? Yep. Even with all those stairs. Now one of the funny things that people don't realize is back when the mill opened, there weren't any stairs. They had to use trap doors, which I'm standing on one right now, that has been reinforced to get up each level. So they would have to put a ladder from the bottom section up to the middle section and so forth to get up here. All the time while they were carrying tools, equipment, and possibly even sacks of wheat or whatever they were working on at the time. So let's move over here. I'm gonna show you the hopper and how all the finished products got brought down to the bottom floors. All right, well, we made it here just about to the end. What you're looking at now is what we call the hopper. It's the largest part and where all of our finished product winds up. So depending on what was being made, whether it was grist, talc, graphite, it all wound up here 
to get sent down through the chutes so it could be bagged and packaged in barrels and sent out. Up here on the fourth floor, this is where it all finishes. So when we started getting the corn and wheat in from the farmers on the bottom floor, by the time it made it up here, went through the final refining machines and bolt machines, it all came down this tube and was put in. This is also one of the most dangerous spots in the mill because by putting the product in at a fast pace, a lot of times, even with these support beams, it would clog up. So people would have to go in, stand on the beams with big long sticks and poke it through, similar to a kitchen funnel. You know, if you pour too much flour in the funnel at once, it stops and sometimes you gotta shake it for it to go through. Same thing had to happen here. But you're standing on beams and you have about a 20 foot drop down. So it was extremely dangerous and you had to be very, very careful while you were performing that act. So as everything comes down here and fills the hopper, it all comes out from the final machine, which is called the bolt machine, which has some incredible history. I can't wait to share for you. Let's come and look at it. All right, everybody, we're here in front of the most important and biggest piece of equipment in the mill, the bolt machine. And it's one of our most famous pieces of equipment. And the reason is it's responsible for the shape of our building. When the bolt machine was brought in in pieces and put together, the top piece they realized didn't fit. So they had to break open the roof so they could make sure the pulleys fit. And that became our monitor and one of our most important features of the outside of the building. But the machine itself is a fine machine. It's a refinery machine with a lot of intricate parts, including cloth inside that would bounce the material that it was making, whether it was grist, talc, graphite. The other important thing is it could only do one at a time. So one thing could be run and that is it. So if we we're running talcum powder, that's all that could be put into the machine. And then it would have to be taken completely apart, cleaned out before another process could go. You have a question? How does the material move from machine to machine? Well, that's a good question. As you see behind me, there are a series of what simply called screws turning devices that are powered by the pulleys, which you saw from downstairs. And that puts it through and moves it very, very slowly into the next phase of the machine, all the way to the chutes and into the hopper. Remember when we started on the ground floor and I showed you the bottom half of the pulley? Well, we finally made it upstairs to the top half. You could see what I was talking about, how large this is and how much power was needed from the water wheel and the powertrain to get up here and turn that so we could operate the bolt machine to finish off our products. So we're going to go down now to the wheelhouse so you can take a beautiful look at the wheel from that view over the water and see exactly how it all came together. Okay everybody, come on into the wheelhouse room. It's funny that they call it the wheelhouse room because it doesn't really house the wheel but it does give you the best view out the window. What it does house, though, is the change in technology that the mill did. In the early 1900s, as technology advanced, so did the mill. So they invented this turbine, which actually is more efficient and powerful than a water wheel. It works just like the water wheel, except instead of being vertical, it's horizontal in the water. And it also harnesses power more efficiently to put it to better use. So this is where everything came through. So also, because the turbine generated some heat and warmed the water, it attracted a lot of fish and turtles, which made it very easy to catch instead of wading out on the river. So the people got much needed enjoyment and a break and were able to drop nets and gather fish to have some fun along with their hard working day. Somebody's got a question. What happens if something gets stuck in the weed? That's actually a good question. That happened quite frequently. Being a flowing river, pieces of trees broke off all the time. The way this was set up, it made it a lot easier and safer for people to climb down through the hole and remove the debris directly from the turbine so that it wouldn't get stuck. So you've seen an awful lot here. And the reason you've seen this is literally because of five people that we call the Red Mill Five. Back when the mill finished operations in the late 50s and was going into ruin, those five people the, whose families lived in this area their whole lives for generations remembered the mill and remembered how honored and proud they were to have the mill support the town, 
employ the town, helped rebuild the town after the fire, and they did not want it to go to waste. So they banded together and they bought the property so it wouldn't be destroyed. Through a lot of hard work and a lot of time, they finally got it preserved under the Preservation Historic Act, and we opened as a, as a museum in the late 60s and as the, uh, the Red Mill Village in 1975, so we're here today to preserve it for your families and their families and generations to come. So the most uh, important and profitable part of the Red Mill Museum Village was the rock quarry. The rock quarry provided limestone that they used to crush rocks for roads, to, to make mortar that was built to, to help rebuild Clinton after their devastating fire, to make fertilizer for all the farms that were nearby. And that was run by the Mulligan family. The office that you see behind me is one of the first state-of-the-art offices back then. It actually incorporated a scale that they could put the rocks and stones on the wagons and weigh them so that they were paid properly. No one had ever done that before. So they were definitely innovators in the business. All right, I'm gonna take you inside now with, at the time, this was considered a very modern office. I'm gonna show you all the highlights that they have and what they use to keep the business running. Come on inside. The Mulligans were one of those families to immigrate over from Ireland, but they worked extremely hard, the whole family. And they were allowed some luxuries that no one else had, which you'll see in the office, including a coal burning stove, which initially they bartered to get the coal and traded limestone for. So they had heat in here. They also incorporated the scale that weighed the stones. So when they sold them for fertilizer, when they sold it for us uh, roads, they were paid properly. So this office was actually one of the first to integrate electricity when it became available. And it was priceless because they were able to communicate with the outside through telegraphs, uh, typewriters, and a telephone when it came. So it was extremely important that they kept up with the changing times to keep the business running. So the Mulligans were one of the wealthiest families when they came over and immigrated from Ireland. That gave them a big advantage on getting the business started. So when they built their office, they worked very, very hard and their whole family was involved. Do you have a question? Uh, what's with the desk with all the holes? <laughs> That's a really good question. Actually, that was one of the first modern filing systems. By having all those holes in, they could keep all their clients' paperwork separately, their payments, and all their information. So they knew exactly where everything was going. It was a very innovative system at the time. All right, next I want to take you out to the actual quarry so you can see the rock cliffs, you can see the limestone for itself and find out how it was processed and all these different things. All right, so this is what's left of the rock quarry. Before it was started to process, it would extend almost another 50 yards out into the museum village, but by processing it and blowing it up, this is what we have left. It was a very long and dangerous process harvesting the limestone from the wall. It would start by drilling holes in and inserting dynamite to blow out chunks. It was a very difficult and very dangerous process. I have a question. Oh, sure. What is it? How do you move the big rocks to the grinder? Very good question. It wasn't easy. It was done by hand using picks and sledgehammers to break it up into pieces that were actually light enough to be dragged by horses over to the screen house. We're here now with the stone crusher, which is the most amazing piece of equipment for the whole quarry processing, and the most important, because this is what was used after the pieces of limestone are blown off into chunks. They come down here to be processed into smaller chunks. So that's what starts this all off. And from there, they enter inside the screen house where it all happens. All right, so the reason the screen house is so big is as we saw before, it starts out as huge boulders going into it and they get broken down into different sizes for different uses. And then they all come out the chutes and get loaded onto wagons or into barrels for processing. 
You have a question for me. Uh, how long does it take for the big rocks to turn into little stone? That is a great question because the different wheels they're put in, huge rocks obviously take a really long time. It could take up to a week to get them down to this size. So they just keep spinning and spinning and they're always alternating processing so that different stones are ready at different times. You're gonna witness now another amazing piece of history here because the conveyor belt that processed the rocks from the quarry still operates. And it's gonna show you how it took the big pieces of limestone, broke them up, went up the conveyor belt and continued processing to the finished product. Amazing that they thought about that all those years ago. And it's a simple process and it still operates today doing the same thing. All right, let's take a close up look at the kiln. So basically a kiln is another name for a furnace, an oven. This is where they basically uh, burn the rock. Now they burned it in the different degrees and levels, depending on the size. When they used it for fertilizer, it'd have to be as fine as possible, and it took a very long time to process. But these pits got extremely hot, you couldn't get close. And as we told you before, when Peg Leg and everybody kept an eye on here to make sure it didn't start any fires. So again, the final process in the quarry was burning the limestone so that we can make all the finished products. So answer the question. How long would the firing process take? Well, that's a good question. There were different levels of it, but like to do the final and um, the finest, I should say, the finest processing, which was going to be the, um, the fertilizer, it would probably burn for at least five days to a fine, fine powder, and when it was cool enough to shovel out. So they really had to keep an eye on it. Another big part of the quarry history is harvesting ice. The Mulligans looked for any way they could to make money, especially in the off season. And ice needed to be harvested because back then, no one had refrigerators or places to store it and they needed to keep their food cold. So during the deepest months of winter and late February is when the ice harvest began. They used a lot of the tools that you see here to cut, to cut it and have it transported into what they called ice houses, where were basically big holes in the ground because the, the longer and deeper you dug, it, the, the colder the ground was. So they used to separate the blocks of ice covered with sawdust to keep it as cold as possible for as long as possible. But there were a lot of different ways to do it. They incorporated different hand saws, uh, saws that were pulled by horses and wagons to cut through, and then they used tongs like you see behind me here, also to, to pick up the pieces and cut them all into smaller pieces. It was a very difficult job, and once they started, sometimes they would work easily 10 hours or more a day until the heist was harvested because they had to get it all as much in as possible before it started to get warm. You have a question? Where did they find the ice? Well, that was the benefit of living right here on the river. Okay, that's why when settlers came in early, the first thing they looked for was water. And they had the benefit of this great river, the South Raritan, right next to us, where they were able to harvest the power of the water to use in the mill, but it also froze over and they had all the ice they wanted. They just had to figure out how to get it. And it wasn't an easy process. Another question. How did they transport the ice from the river up to the ice house? That's a really good question. Similar to where they, the way they did it with the limestone, they would break the ice into manageable pieces that weren't too heavy to move. Then they would cut around them with a big saw, tie ropes around them, and then they would have to have their horses out and actually draw them and pull them out of the, the water, have them dragged across to the end of the river where they can mount them onto the back of a wagon and get them to the ice house. Very difficult and very heavy process. Everyone was involved with trying to get as much ice as possible in to just get through the winter. I'm on the porch here of what we call the tenant house. And the reason it's called the tenant house is because the tenants live here. Uh, a lot of families lived here that worked at the mill. It was just a lot more convenient for them to be on property because the mill and the quarry ran long, long hours. So being here made it a lot easier to come to and from work and be available whenever they're needed. 
but it was very crowded in there. They tried to fit as many people as they possibly could. Of course, being right across from the river was a huge advantage using that to, to eat, clean their clothes, and just generally live. The tenant house was a very difficult building to maintain, being in such close proximity to the quarry. Every time it blasted, it shattered rocks onto the roof. The vibration would break windows. So they really had to prepare when they knew that was happening. So a lot of times they were covered up with wood and making preparations to keep the children inside so nobody got hurt. At one point later on, when the, the work waned out during the seasons, they turned part of the tenant house into like a general store. So they were able to sell goods. So even though they got to live here for free, they still had to buy some of the materials that they needed to live. And this was a convenient spot to, to open up and sell them some goods. Oh, you have a question for me. Uh, did they have to pay rent? And if so, how much did they have to pay? That's a really good question. Well, one of the benefits, if you remember, we talked about before, pay was very, very little here, sometimes usually about 12 cents a day. So one of the benefits they had was being able to stay here rent free and, and with their families. So they thought, especially the Mulligan family from the quarry, that if they were here and their families together, they'd work harder for them, which was actually true. So this here is Peg Leg Shack. No place on the mill grounds has more folklore and stories associated than this building right here. But the truth is, it's not that exciting. It was part of uh, being built here for the workers who worked on the quarry. And the reason it was put here is because the kilns would burn the limestone all night and the fires would stay really hot. So someone had to be here all the time to watch it to make sure there were no wildfires. So Peg Leg was actually a worker and a friend of the Mulligan family who did only have one leg from a childhood accident. So they liked him, they felt sorry for him, he was a good worker. So he was in here for most of the time that the, the grounds were operating as a rock quarry. You have a question? Um, how much money would the person living in here make? Okay, well there was a big, big difference back then in those times, are you ready? A worker that like peg leg made about 12 cents a day working in the quarry. And not only did he have that, he risked his life because it was a very, very dangerous job. But back then there wasn't much work to be had by anyone. So 12 cents was about as much as anybody could get. But you got to remember back then things didn't cost a whole lot more. And here they fed him. He had a place to live he didn't have to pay for. So he was able to save up until he was able to leave and move on. So Peg Leg had a very important function on being here. By being right across from the kilns, he could keep an eye on them all night when everyone else was asleep to make sure there were no fires and everything was protected. So he, the place could not have survived without him. So now that we've seen all the aspects from start to finish, from the rocks coming off of there, coming out of the kilns, being shipped out and being processed, you've seen how difficult and hard life it was living here on when it was a quarry. So I really hope that you got a lot out of this. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul, welcome to the museum and the forge. Has anyone been in a blacksmith shop before? Excellent. Any place local? No, have you been yeah, here? You look easy. familiar, right? Well, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but this is a coal forge. This is bituminous coal. This is what I use to heat the metal up. It arrives in this sort of lump form, right? Once it heats up a little bit, it turns into something we call coke. And after that, the ash or the result, result of uh, burnt coal is called clinker, which I'll show you a piece later on. Now, over here I have a rheostat that controls my fan. You can hear the fan accelerate. This little rod is connected to a gate-like device underneath the firebox that opens and allows or closes and restricts the flow of air up through the coals. Okay, More heat, more air usually means more heat. And that's what we need to get the metal hot. Now, to, to handle hot metal, I use these things called tongs, okay? Tongs are sized to the work. These tongs fit <coughs> material like this, quarter-inch round bar, 
or maybe as big as 3 eighths. I put it in here. And what I'm going to demonstrate is something I call a two heat coat hook. Two heats means I put it in the fire two times. That's the first time. Everybody's counting, right? Okay, that's one. So I put it in two times. First heat, I'll bring it over here to the anvil. I'll flatten out an end and make a curl. So blacksmiths like to talk and brag sometimes about just how fast they can work. And the way that we measure how fast we are is the number of heats, okay? So this piece of metal, if you're interested to know, was part of a stall gate, okay? And it had been kicked hundreds and hundreds of times and was bent all out of shape, which is a fun expression, isn't it? Bent out of shape? We get that from blacksmithing. Anyway, the stall gate had nothing more to give except for its parts. Here we go. Take it right here to the anvil. I flatten out an end. I make a little curl towards myself, away. back towards myself and that's the first half of the hook. All right, you can see I'm using the tongs to hold the hot metal. Does anybody think this is safe to touch right here in the gray part? Nobody thinks that, right? What happens if I touch it? It'll burn your silver. It'll burn my gloves. Anyway, put it back in the fire the other way around to heat up the top to make the mounting point. Now, these little hooks are functional, sort of decorative, they're practical items that any blacksmith would have been making um, at a shop like this years ago. Now, since the other side was already hot, this doesn't take very long. Sometimes people say, oh, how do you know it's ready? By the color. This is probably ready, but I like to work it pretty hot. Okay, bring it over here. First thing I do is flatten out an end. I'm turning the hammer around, I'm going to use the other end of the hammer to make dimples here at the top of the mounting point. Okay, and now I use a bristle brush to clean up the work. Now you can't tell what I'm doing here, but I want to keep the metal off the surface of the anvil as much as I can because I want it to stay hot. Okay? At the same time, I'm removing as much of the scaly uh, surface as I can because I want this hook to look nice. Okay? You can see it's cleaner now, right? It's still incredibly hot. Nobody's going to be tempted to put their hand out and touch it, right? Now this part might surprise you. This is a candle. I'm melting the wax on the hook. The wax will provide a protection against rust, okay? It brings out a little bit of the black color of the metal underneath. Now this metal, we don't really know what it is. I call it mystery metal. It didn't come with a pedigree. Um, this was used metal, so we're not really sure. But I can tell it's, it's just mild steel, all right? Um, we can work with any malleable metal, but most of us work with steel. We don't get an opportunity to work with wrought iron. Wrought iron hasn't been made for more than 100 years, and um, it's pretty hard to come by. Anyway, the next step is to get a little rag, wipe off the excess wax. I'll dip it real quick. Okay, so now that it's been dipped, it's safe to, to touch. I'm going to drill a hole through the top of the mounting point using this drill press. Okay, so what I'll do is I line up the drill bit with a dimple that's right there in the middle. 
and I lower the drill bit down to the surface of the hook. Throw this lever. Now with each rotation of the flywheel, the drill bit spins two and a quarter times. It's being forced down into the work. So let me show you. the shavings starting to erupt off the end of the drill bit. That's what a hook looks like. Uh, sometimes it ends up with a little burr over here. Uh, so I'll just hit it with a hammer. This is what a two heat coat hook looks like. Real quick. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? Um, what kind of items did blacksmiths make? Anything that would have been made out of metal. So everything that a farmer would use out in the field, everything that uh, a mason would use, stone hammers, chisels. Um, everything a carpenter would use, everything a farmer would use, plowshares. Have you ever heard of John Deere? The company John Deere? Hmm? John Deere is probably the world's most famous blacksmith, right? Because originally uh, the John Deere company made plows. Um, the other thing is, the work a blacksmith would do depended on where they were located, right? If we were in Nantucket, right, years ago, I probably would have been making things that a whaling ship would have needed. Um, if we were in Iowa, I'd probably be making more things that have to do with agriculture and farming, you know, cultivating fields. If I was in Maine, I'd be making axes and tools to handle logs. So wherever it was that you were located would determine the type of things that you would make. Additionally, various, the changes in seasons would also determine what would be, was being made. Because you don't need a plow in the winter, right? You need a plow in the spring, perhaps, to turn some soil. So uh, it was seasonal work also. Horses always needed shoes. Um, and so a lot of blacksmith shops have been making a lot of shoes. Then with the advent of, uh, well, wagons, they make the rims, right? Uh, the metal part that goes on the, the wooden spoke wheels. And um, a lot of blacksmiths would then specialize. So they might just be really good at being, uh, making horseshoes and they, they became farriers. Farriers in our time is a blacksmith specialization work on uh, horses hooves and not much else but a general blacksmith would have been making all kinds of blacksmith blacksmith or metal items for the town and to support businesses um, locally anyone else yeah uh, can you make a knife I can make knives um, I was more interested in making knives when I first started that's kind of the I don't want to speak for all the blacksmiths in the world but that's many the, the, the path for many of us. You know, the first thing you make is probably a hook. And maybe then the second thing you make might be an S hook. And then after that you're probably gonna want to start making knives. Yes? When did you first learn to be a blacksmith? Well I think I'm still learning, but I've been doing this for about twelve years. I learned right here. But my my background was welding. And modern welding is the great great grandchild of this work, okay, because they still needed a way to connect metals and they would do it in what's known as a forge weld and that's taking two pieces of similar metal, adding a flux, joining them together and hitting them with a hammer until they've fused. 
okay? So modern welding, whether it's electric, friction, gas, um, or any other number of different methods, it achieves the same thing. It joins pieces of metal. More sophisticated, we can join dissimilar types of pieces of metal now, um, which they would have definitely struggled with in the past. But anyway, that's how I got started. I took a course in welding at a night school, and uh, then I started working for the now director of the museum, and at a certain point he offered me a job of blacksmith, which made, made a lot of sense. So, um, But I also watch a lot of YouTube videos. I have a stack of books this high, and I used to attend different uh, blacksmith group meetings here in New Jersey. So there's, there's a lot of ways to learn how to do this if you're interested. This is the Red School House at the Red Mill, and um, my name is Marilyn, and I'd like to welcome you today. Um, do we want to start with a question? Uh, what time period do I see uh, Schoolhouse built in? Actually, the schoolhouse, the original schoolhouse for Hunterdon County, was built in 1734, and it was a log cabin. What you see today was actually the schoolhouse that was in Hunterdon County in Alexandria Township. Um, at one point, it became so run down, people didn't really want to spend money repairing it. And it looked like this. If you can want to come in closer, take a peek. Um, this has a sign on it that says, we're on our way to the Clinton Museum. So you can see that that building really needed a lot of work. And they brought it here to the, to the, the site at uh, the Red Mill and uh, renovated the building. So at the time, it was all the children came from within a mile or two of the schoolhouse. And they walked to school in the morning, probably, they probably had to be at school at nine o'clock in the morning, and they went till four o'clock in the afternoon, which was a long day. They would bring their lunch and they'd have already done their chores because most of the kids, well, all of the kids lived on farms and they had to, they each had chores that they had to do before they came to school. So um, you can see that there were many, many children that came into the schoolhouse. And this is a picture of one of the years when it was uh, actually in Alexandria. And um, you can see that, did they, do you think they look happy going to school? Anybody? Probably not as happy as you kids. But part of the reason was because when they took photographs of the, at that time, they had to stand still for a very long time and pose. And then it's easier to sit there like, like this than mm, like that. So same thing with this particular uh, picture. So let's go into the schoolhouse. And uh, what I want you to do is to line up by the stairs, boys on one side, girls on the other. And after that point, I'm going to turn into Jekyll and Hyde. I will no longer be a really nice person. I'm going to be as strict as the teachers back then were. All right, we had a lot of children. We had to have law and order. So let's go over to the steps. All right, good morning children. Uh, let's have the girls on this side and the boys on that side. Stand at the bottom of the stairs. I am going to go in and ring the bell. When you hear the bell, you may come into the schoolhouse quietly. There's no more talking unless I speak to you. I am the only one that's talking from now on. Okay, so hold on. So on a regular day at school, um, all of the students would bring their own lunch from home. And you would have a lunch pail, something like this, and you'd bring it to the schoolhouse, and we would store it on one side. Uh, the types of things that children would bring at that time would have been um, no takeout, of course. They would have had maybe a piece of bread, maybe a piece of fruit, an apple, a um, piece of cow tongue, something really delicious that they would enjoy bringing, or what the, whatever the family at home produced. Because all of the food that they had, they would um, 
have to be self-reliant and they made all the food themselves. So um, the beverages that they could bring would have been beer, watered down beer, water, or cider. Now, does anyone have a question about any one of those things? Yes. Where would we get our drinks from? You, you'd get your drinks, you'd get your water, your water would come from the pump that you might have seen outside, and if you were a very good student, I would allow you, Luke, to go outside and get the water from the well and put it in this, bring it into the children, and everybody could have a drink from the cup, right? Are you thirsty? Okay, what do you think about everybody drinking from the same cup? Good idea? Not anymore. <laughs> so that would, that would be your food and your, your lunch would be over there. So you would have to go the whole day with just whatever you brought. You also would have to bring uh, a piece of coal from home. And th that would go in the stove and that would keep the place warm. As you notice, it's a little cooler in here than even outside. And it's actually a fairly warm day today. But um, they had no electricity at that time. Uh, they had large windows and all the light came in from the windows and kept the building as light as, as possible. Um, they did have uh, kerosene lamps. They used kerosene lamps and the teacher would be in charge of controlling the wicks and getting those going. Okay, if you're new to my classroom, I just want, to know, want you all to know that ordinarily, um, when these schools were built with just one room, there were many, many children here. There could be up to 40 children. And they would sit on benches such as this one here on the right, or on the left, a plain bench with no back. And you would have to sit there and be very quiet. And the order and discipline was the, the name of the game. You could not be noisy, you couldn't talk to your friends, you couldn't pull on somebody's hair, you had to be quiet. So I'm going to read you some of the rules and some of the ways that the teacher got your attention and made you behave yourself. So uh, number one was re respect your schoolmaster, obey him or her, and accept punishments. Do not call your classmates names or fight with them. Love and help each other. Never make noises or disturb your neighbors as they work. So that meant you had to be quiet. You had to be quiet during classes and do not talk unless it was absolutely necessary. If you wanted to get the teacher's attention, you could raise your hand, but you don't keep being a pest, you know? <laughs> so, um, and do not leave your seat without permission. No more than one student at a time, they go to the washroom, which we will discuss shortly. Bring firewood into the classroom for the stove whenever the teacher tells you to do so go quietly in and out of the classroom. If the teacher calls your name after class, your job would be to straighten the benches and tables, sweep the room, dust, and leave everything tidy. Now some of the ways that the teachers got the students to behave themselves was they would hit them on the side of the head. They called boxing your ears. You would, you know, you'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just got hit. Or they would take this little stick here and whack you on the back of your hand, and you'd, you'd feel it. You would behave yourself, no talking. Uh, or they had a whip. They could use a whip on you. So one of the ways that the teachers would shame the children would be to um, apply the dunce cap to the child. And what, can I have a volunteer for this? All right, so what they would do would be to put the hat on the student, and uh, what do you think about that? Does that make him look kind of you know, silly or very, very silly. All right, it's not such a big punishment, is it? Really. So what they would do next would be, uh, would you like to take a seat right over here? So do you think this is a better or worse situation? If, is he going to be more shamed by sitting in the window or just sitting on the, on the dunce stool? What do you think? I think it would be more, you would feel more shameful because the people in the tenant house and your parents possibly could see you. Right. So if his neighbor went by the schoolhouse today and saw him sitting here with a dunce cap on, um, he'd go home, certainly go home and tell your parents that he, I saw your son in the window with the dunce cap on. So what do you think would happen to him when he went home? Somebody would speak up? 
Yes? Maybe extra chores? Extra chores? Maybe they take them out behind the wood pile. Ever heard of that? So that would not be very nice. Thank you for demonstrating. <laughs> Behave yourself now. So another way would be, um, do we have somebody who's nosy here? Oh yes, why don't you come up for a moment? Okay, so this young man is very nosy and I want him to put his nose right there on the board and stay there until I tell him we can stop. Can I have a young lady to come up and I'll show you what other kind of discipline they would use? Come on up here. So I understand you do remember your lessons? Shame on you. And what they would do to a young lady would be to hook her up and leave her there until I told her to stop. This way she's going to really learn her lessons. So when the school last was built, uh, the teachers, they had to recruit from, from the neighborhood. And generally they were um, probably not even much older than the old student. They learned um, as they went through the school. And it, it was a, a version of actually like homeschooling is today. People learn from their parents and then they came to school and the teacher more or less finished them off. But most of the education was done through rote. In other words, you memorize things and then you repeated it back to their class. Most of the teachers were men because uh, if you were a woman and you had a, a boyfriend, you were automatically fired. You could not have uh, be married or actually be a teacher if you had a boyfriend or a husband. <laughs> So do we have any questions about the teachers? Uh, how much did they get paid? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, the teachers were not paid very much, and that's why they, a lot of times they were only in the schoolhouse for a very limited period of time. But they were paid, it wasn't like a public school system is today, um, it was paid by the parents of the children who went to school. And they would pay them with vegetables, fruit, eggs, maybe some meat or fish or something like that. And a lot of times they lived in the homes of one of their students. So um, cash, they probably were not receiving much cash. But they had a place to live and they had food to eat. Yes? Um, what kind of subjects and lessons would they have? In the classroom, they would have mathematics, which is your addition and subtraction, and they would have writing, which was very important, and reading. They did some geography, a little bit of history. Uh, the reading and writing was very, very important, and mainly they were the most important subjects for the, for the classroom. And they were taught with uh, figures on a sheet of paper or shell, and the students would just trace over them to learn how to write them. Um, paper was very scarce. They did not have paper, they didn't have, they had little chalkboards for learning how to write on the chalkboards, but the younger children were not given chalkboards, they would use the sand table over here. One of the ways that children were taught how to write was to be shown the letters in the sand uh, box over here. It's not really a play toy, it's how you make your letters. So, young lady, would you like to show us how you would write your ABCs in the sand box? Okay, so if you had a younger sibling come to school with you, you would bring him up or her and teach the letters to that child. All right, thank you very much. So the school day is over and it is time for you children to go home and get to work at your house. Uh, you'll be walking home maybe a mile or two, try to get home before dark and do all your chores when you get home. Thank you for visiting. You might may sit up and walk up by Welcome to the deluxe accommodations of the Red Mill Museum Village. This was as good as it gets back then, folks. This is a log cabin where you could have as many as 8 to 12 people actually living in here at the same time. Everything was done in here from cooking, heating, sleeping, making clothes. This is basically where your inside shelter, everything took place. Everything was used, nothing was wasted, even an old gourd was dried out and cut into a spoon for serving. Uh, you had a bed which sometimes you could literally have three or four people sleeping in it. You might ask why is it short? That's because back then people didn't believe in sleeping lying down. They fought for health reasons. Everyone 
sat up when they slept. It also created more space. And we have basically the same thing up here where you would see um, like bunk beds where all the children would sleep. And again, there could be six or eight of them up there at the same time. This was held together by mortar, which was made from the limestone that was crushed. It had to be replaced every season because it would dry out and crack. So they keep the water from coming in. Very difficult living conditions, but again, the best at the time. Um, Question. What are the shutters on the windows for? Well, that's really a good point and very observant. There were two things that they were used for. First of all, basically when they slept, they kept the light out. So it was dark, so everybody would sleep because that's what they did back then. Um, the other thing, which was very practical, as we saw before at the quarry, remember me talking about how they used to use dynamite and blast the rocks? Well, that was so loud and so much vibration that sometimes it shattered the glass windows. And windows were very, very, very expensive and hard to get back then. So by shutting the shutters before the blasting, it helped preserve the windows. You had another question, yes? Uh, what's with the rope on the bed? Well, <laughs> that's great. That's actually their mattress. Uh, they didn't have mattresses back then, so they used rope. Uh, they also had a system and they used a tool just like this where they literally put the rope inside and tightened it so that after every night, after everybody's supporting everyone's weight, it sagged. So this would tighten the rope back up. They would put enough blankets on top so it wasn't getting rope burn and very uncomfortable. But that's the only way they had to sleep back then. All right, everybody, come on over. I'm going to show you the spring house. This is the closest thing that they had to a refrigerator back then. It was basically a hole in the ground. The further down that you dug into the ground, the colder that the water got, and that's hence the spring water that would come up. So they would try to make it as deep as they could and manageable so that when they had ice that they kept for themselves and they packed meat and the weather started getting warmer, they would store it all in here and it would last a lot longer until they were able to finish processing it and cook it. So it was a very, very important building to have back then. Without it, everything would spoil immediately and then he'd be in trouble. I wanna thank you all so much for coming and joining us on this incredible tour today at the Red Mill Museum Village. I really hope you learned a lot today and you take something back home with you to share with your friends and family. Please visit our website, look at the information to possibly become even a member of our museum. We're totally nonprofit, so we appreciate all donations and people visiting. That's what keeps this place alive for generations to come. Thank you, it was really good. Thank you.